Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the EOL seminar series. Our speaker today is no stranger to EOL. I am pleased to welcome Dr. Matthew Heyman, who is a project scientist at EOL with RSF, the Remote Sensing Facility. Dr. Heyman is a University of Colorado graduate through and through. He received his bachelor's and PhD in electrical engineering from CU specializing in optics. Matt went on to do an ASP postdoc at NCAR and never left. And for that, we are fortunate. At EOL, Matt has worked on remote and in-situ optical sensors, including LIDAR, cloud probes, and wind measuring instrumentation. Currently, Matt is part of the team to research and develop the Micropulse Differential Absorption LIDAR, also known as MPD. This instrument provides unprecedented spatial and temporal observations of water vapor profiles in the lower troposphere. During Dr. Heyman's tenure at NCAR, he and colleagues have acquired several patents that work with various optical sensor technology, such as LIDARs. And in 2018, as part of the Micropulse Dial team, was awarded the UCAR Scientific and Technical Achievement Award. This segues nicely into introducing his talk, which uses the Micropulse dial and cloud probe data to test innovative signal processing techniques to improve their measurements. His title is Modern, signal, Modern Signaling Processing Techniques for Atmospheric Sensors. We are using Slido to post questions, which you can type in at any time during the seminar. The Slido window is located below this presentation screen. We archive all questions until the end of the speaker's presentation where they will be revealed during the Q&A portion of the talk. Dr. Matt Heyman, welcome to our EO seminar series and the virtual stage is now yours. Hi everybody. Thanks for that uh, introduction, Jackie. And thanks for noticing the typo in my title. <laughs> um, I meant to title this Modern Signal Processing Techniques for Atmospheric Sensors, but I guess my fingers got carried away when I was writing the title. Um, but anyway, thank you all for tuning into this talk. Um, for those of you that don't know me, I'm in the LIDAR group at NCAR, along with my colleagues Robert Stilwell and Scott Spuler. And my formal training, as Jackie mentioned, uh, is in optical engineering. But in the last five years or so, I've been taking a little bit of a journey into the realm of statistical signal processing uh, with the help of uh, Villain Murai, uh, who has an actual uh, expertise and basis in statistical signal processing. And he's at the University of Wisconsin Space Science and Engineering Center. Um, this work is the product of a number of cross-institutional collaborations uh, obviously, as I mentioned, University of Wisconsin, um, NCAR, Montana State University, and now most recently we can add uh, University of Colorado at Boulder to our list of collaborators. So let's just jump right into an atmospheric sensing problem. Let's say you want to recover um, particle cloud particle concentrations uh, in a cloud. And uh, you know a couple things about clouds, right? So first of all, clouds don't have homogeneous concentrations uh, throughout the cloud, right? It's, it's changing spatially um, in that cloud. And also those cloud particles are randomly distributed. So you build a sensor and, and maybe fly it on an aircraft that basically just detects cloud particles. So every time a particle passes through this plane, you just register a little count. Um, on your detection system. And you know that, of course, there's going to be bunching of these particles and you'll recover a sig signal over some time period that looks like this. So you get particles that are close together in some cases and spread out in others. And the question is, how do you process this data in order to recover the true um, particle concentration as a function of time as you were flying through this cloud. So these observations are discrete. You wanna recover some sort of continuous function within the limit to the best of your ability. 
Um, and so a natural approach to solving this problem is to build a histogram. So you would create bins in time and count how many particles fell into each of those bins, right? And then those bins, because of those particles are randomly distributed in space, those bins would be Poisson random numbers. Um, and taking that data and forming this histogram, we will get uh, something like this, right? And so we can see that, yeah, we can recover some clouds, some of the structure in the particle concentration through the clouds, but um, this data is pretty noisy because we're observing uh, randomly distributed cloud particles. Uh, so one way we can suppress that random noise is to do more averaging, which is the same akin to making our bins larger. So if I make our bins a factor of 10 larger, now we're able to suppress the random noise uh, quite well, but you can see that we've got a bias in some regions where we're not able to recover that concentration structure. The structure is varying much faster than we're able to resolve um, given the amount of averaging we're doing. Right, so this kind of sets up our problem. Um, there are we're able to uh, suppress noise by averaging more, but that also potentially adds bias. And it depends on the particular scene we're investigating, what's really the optimal amount of averaging. Now, there is an optimal bin width for this problem. It ends up looking like this. And we can determine this actually without knowing the true um, particle concentration data through um, a technique called uh, Poisson thinning and applying holdout cross-validation to it. Um, so that gives us an optimal bin width for this problem, but I'm gonna be talking about an algorithm uh, where we don't prescribe a specific bin width across the whole data set. We're gonna use an algorithm that basically tries to find the correlated structure within our signal and, and therefore effectively average across those intervals. So the blue shows the application of this algorithm and you see in this region here, we're averaging quite a bit more, but in some of these other regions, we're doing relatively little averaging with that algorithm. Now, this plot shows the total error in the, error in the triangles as a function of our histogram bin width. The squares just show the amount of error that's the result of statistical variation. And as, you, as we increase our bin sizes, we can see that that total error goes down. We hit our optimal bin width here at 30 nanoseconds. And then the statistical error has been going down. It continues to go down as we increase bin width, but we get that increase in error from biases resulting from over averaging. If we apply our algorithm to this, we're only going to apply it at the very finest um, scale resolution where we have very noisy data. So there's only one data point here, um, but it's actually going to give us a lower error than any, any of our potential binning options. So when we apply this algorithm, for most of this talk, we'll be simply applying it to very noisy high resolution histogram data. However, it can also be applied to the raw individual particle count data. So um, up to this point, I have been showing an example of, of a processing problem where we're dealing with a 1D signal that we're trying to recover. However, for most of this talk, we're gonna be trying to recover uh, images or two-dimensional signals. And so an application of that to actual data is shown here. This, uh, Plot down on the bottom is uh, histogram data as a function of particle diameter as a function of time. So basically, particle size distributions captured by an optical array probe that flew on the outside of the G5 during the Socrates field campaign. Basically, the way this works is as particles fly through these probe arms, we get little one bit images of the particles. We can then size those images and put them into a histogram. <clears throat> And so these, the histogram data is, is not that noisy when we have very high particle concentrations, but when you get to these larger particles, um, the data is still quite noisy and we're able to apply our algorithm to this in order to recover the variations in the uh, structure of the cloud particle data 
and separate that noise from, from the actual structural variations. So up until this point, I've just been talking about uh, cloud probes, um, but now I'm gonna make the transition over to LIDAR uh, and exclusively just talk about LIDAR data. But my hope is that you'll recognize that there's actually a lot of atmospheric sensors where you're making these kinds of discrete observations. Now, instead of having a particle detector, I'm gonna have a photon detector. And instead of having particles, I'm gonna have photons hitting the detector, but I'm still trying to recover um, the, the concentration or the mean count rate uh, of those photons from that signal. So the algorithm I'm talking about today is called Poisson Total Variation or PTV. And this is based on uh, medical imaging uh, techniques that were uh, developed by Re Rebecca Willett starting about two decades ago. And this plot, uh, these plots uh, from Harmony et al. show an example of the application of that, where you have uh, noisy tomographic data and you're trying to recover some sort of image from that noisy data um, as compared to the actual image. And the way this, is, this works is we're going to assume, first of all, that our image has non-random structure. And then we're, we want to separate that non-random image structure from the noisy observations. So we're going to do that by basically fitting those uh, those fitting to those noisy ob noisy observations by pre performing some sort of linear projection onto the noisy data from our estimated image. Now we're going to promote image structure by penalizing changes in the estimated image here, which is why you see this kind of patchy structure, and that's done through a process called regularization. Uh, in 2016, Bill and Murai published a paper where he adapted this technique for LIDAR applications and for nonlinear uh, non uh, parameterizations, uh, which are more common in our LIDAR, LIDAR atmospheric LIDAR retrievals. Um, this just shows an example of an extinction retrieval from a high spectral resolution LIDAR. Uh, this is uh, cirrus clouds here up at 13, 14 kilometers uh, as a function of time. And you can see what he gets by applying Poisson total variation to recover that extinction as opposed to the standard met approach for processing that HSRL data. Um, and so it's, it's pretty much no question, uh, PTV gives you a better product just based on that image. So PTV is effectively um, trying to solve a minimization problem. And there are two terms in our minimization cost function. One is a goodness of fit term, and this is going to be smaller as the fit gets better. And the second term is a regularization term. And this is going to penalize your estimated variable, whatever that is, extinction, water vapor. You're, it's going to add a penalty every time it changes value. Um, and then we're going to have some sort of scalar uh, constant that we multiply that to determine the amount of regularization. So the idea here is initially when you're running your optimization, you're going to be improving your fit. But at some point, you're going to get diminishing returns from improving that fit because you're going to need to vary X significantly in order to get a better fit. And the regularization loss starts to take over. So in this example, we have noisy data in the, in the gray dots. And then for small amounts of regularization, we might get something like the blue, um, not exactly, not completely fitting the noise, but um, definitely seems to be capturing some of it. And then larger amounts of regularization, we get something more like the orange where it's not changing rapidly. Now, there's always an optimal amount of regularization and so um, we're going to have to use holdout cross-validation in order to determine how much regularization should be applied to the image that we're processing. The first application of PTV here at NCAR was done um, by applying it to a few short um, flight legs during the Socrates field campaign on the G5 HSRL. So um, this is data that was captured where the LIDAR was looking up and the aircraft was flying uh, 
starting in the marine boundary layer and, and going to uh, multiple layers of clouds. Zoom in, showing the backscatter coefficient retrieval using our standard processing approach. You can see cloud structure and precipitation in here. And then Poisson total variation, our, our own developed version of that applied to um, that same data. And you can see that we are able to recover some structure in areas that were otherwise, uh, that were previously too noisy to recover structure. So HSRL data um, makes for great images. Um, I think they look impressive myself, but uh, ultimately it's very hard to validate this kind of observation through any sort of direct comparison. So enter the micropole style or MPD. The MPD is a thermal dynamic profiling LIDAR. It's designed for network deployment. And this instrument, um, it's quantitative, but it's low cost. So the idea here is that for the same cost as one like high power quantitative instrument, you could have multiple low power quantitative instruments, uh, giving you a little bit more uh, spatial coverage with, with the instrumentation. Um, it operates at low laser power. And uh, so this is a totally eye-safe instrument. If somebody climbed on the instrument and looked down into the window, they would not be harmed by it, they'd be fine. Uh, but that also means that we're dealing with noisy signals. So potentially uh, some significant benefits from applying advanced signal processing techniques to this. The instrument's also low maintenance and designed for unatt unattended operation. Uh, we have five micropole styles at NCAR. And all five of those instruments are capable of measuring water vapor through the water vapor dial technique. However, two of those also have HSRLs for measuring backscatter coefficient and oxygen dials for measuring temperature. For now, I'm just gonna focus on the water vapor retrievals though, because that's the main component of our current collaboration with Phelan. So what I'm showing here is just some raw data from the micropole style system. We have two observation channels in the water vapor uh, retrievals. So we have one observation, which is just measuring backscatter from the atmosphere, and a second observation, which is measuring backscatter attenuated by water vapor. So by combining those two observations, we can recover the amount of water vapor in the atmosphere. Now, these um, observations are, in fact, uh, photon count histograms accumulated over a 24 hour period. Um, I'm just showing up to a range of eight kilometers. Our total range actually um, goes up, well, our, our total uh, captured data goes up to about 20 kilometers. Um, but what you're actually seeing here are uh, photon counts, which are random number, which are um, noisy observations or, or sorry, Poisson random numbers. They're drawn from a Poisson PDF parameterized by a physical relationship between the amount of water vapor in the atmosphere uh, and our actual observed signal. So um, you're looking at the raw random data, but our first step in performing our standard retrieval of water vapor, though we don't ever say this explicitly is to just ignore the fact that we're looking at random numbers and assume that we're looking directly at the parameterization, that physical parameterization. Once we make that assumption, we can apply algebra and simply solve for the amount of water vapor in the air. Um, if we just do this directly, it's pretty noisy data and not very useful. So we need to apply some signal processing in order to suppress the noise and bring out the water vapor structure. So our standard approach to doing this is applying a low pass filter. And you can see then we can actually recover uh, a lot of the water vapor in the atmosphere. Notably, I am showing you the unmasked, unvarnished truth here. There are regions where it is still too noisy to recover water vapor. Normally in our QC process, we'd be masking this out. Um, but you can see there are certainly regions where we do get good water vapor signals. Um, and we can overall see what the water vapor structure looks like. Now, something that we need to keep in mind is that when we process uh, this data and we apply a smoothing kernel, we are inherently making assumptions about the structure of the water vapor. 
And because that assumption is not always going to be valid, there are going to be cases where we're over smoothing and smearing out the water vapor structure. And there are going to be cases where we're under smoothing and the data is going to be excessively noisy. So the PTB approach to processing water vapor does not ignore the fact that we're observing a water um, a Poisson random number. So instead of uh, simply assuming that observation is truth, we are going to try to estimate the physical parameterization. And we're going to do that by, by <clears throat> using physics to map the water vapor estimate onto those original noisy observations while promoting the image structure using regularization. So now we have a water vapor, um, estimated water vapor signal, which can be rapidly varying in some places. Uh, in other places, we may be averaging a considerable amount in order to recover uh, an accurate estimate of the water vapor. So this is just a side-by-side -side comparison of our standard approach to recovering absolute humidity compared to PTV. Notably, the standard method is not bad, but we can potentially get improvements by applying more sophisticated signal processing techniques. There are regions where um, the standard method is noisier than PTB. Um, and notably, uh, we are actually able to, in some circumstances, extend the range of, of the water recovered water vapor signal. Um, this shows a comparison of a sound launch during this uh, time period. We have absolute humidity of the sound in gray, <clears throat> uh, and then the standard method in red, and then PTV shown in blue. And you can see the standard method, particularly as we move up higher in altitude, becomes noisier, and we're able to recover a uh, water vapor signal up higher uh, than we normally could um, using PTV. So this is an example of the first direct comparison validation study with PTV. And um, our development effort has been pretty successful. We actually processed an entire field project using PTV uh, last summer. And we have a paper coming out. Uh, it's, well, it's currently in discussion in atmospheric measurement techniques. And these are just two summary plots uh, from that. My lights just went off. <laughs> these are two summary plots from uh, that paper where we compared uh, the standard method now shown in blue against two variants of PTV that we considered in the paper, uh, along with a comparison to the SGP uh, Raman LiDAR system, which is a high power uh, LiDAR system. And this was compared, this comparison was done uh, it was, it's from data from the MPD network test uh, and uh, with a comparison of over 100 radio sons. Um, and what we see is if you compare the standard method and PTV up to about two kilometers, they're pretty similar in terms of performance, but then the error in the standard method starts to take off and PTV is outperforming it considerably. Interesting though, is that while the Raman lighter does better than the MPD down below about two kilometers, somewhere about three kilometers, we find that um, actually MPD with the PTV signal processing is, is outperforming the Raman lighter. So Raman lighter is um, certainly uh, a high power system. It's, it has a power aperture product 500 times greater than the MPD. So this sort of highlights um, the enhanced capability you can get from a low cost instrument if you're willing to apply more sophisticated signal processing techniques. Okay, so I skipped a key term uh, in, in the minimization process at the beginning of the talk. So I wanna, I'm gonna take a step back and go back to that, which is the goodness of fit term. So a lot of times when we are performing fitting, we'll use something like mean square error but in our case, we're not going to use that because we're doing maximum likelihood estimation. And mean square error is only the maximum likelihood um, estimate for uh, a uniform distribute, sorry, a uniform variance Gaussian random number. But we're dealing with Poisson random numbers where our probability distribution function um, is, a, is a function of one parameter, which is basically the mean counts. So I've shown a Poisson PDF here 
for a mean counts, which is kind of like our true signal of uh, 3.2. And the PDF obviously answers the question, given a parameterization of mean counts alpha, what's the probability we observe Y photon counts? But we're not really interested in that. We're interested in the inverse of that problem, which is given that we observed Y photon counts, what's the most likely value of that true signal alpha? So notably, when we go between the PDF um, in a Poisson distribution, we're going from a discrete, um, discrete Y values to a continuous X axis for alpha. So alpha can assume any, um, any value there. It's a continuous function in the likelihood case. Now we don't um, deal with the likelihood function directly. Instead, we deal with the negative log likelihood, um, which uh, converts our, our problem into a minimization problem. And, uh, and this becomes our goodness of fit term that we're using uh, as our metric. So for a Poisson PDF, just so that you know, no, we're not using mean square error. This is actually the negative log likelihood for a Poisson PDF. Um, for a single observation, this isn't very interesting. In this case, I, I'm plotting for an observation of two photon counts, and the most likely estimate of alpha is two. Uh, however, we can compound this across multiple observations where we then take a product of likelihood functions or similarly sum the log likelihoods uh, in order to get a total um, uh, uh, estimation metric or, or minimization problem across multiple observations. So as I mentioned, typically we're assuming that our data is uh, Poisson distributed, and that's true as long as our photon arrival rates are uh, relatively low. However, when we get into very high photon arrival rates, we have to start accounting for some non-ideal behavior in our detection and acquisition electronics. So our detectors have an effect called dead time, where any time a photon is registered and counted by the detector, um, it goes dead for some sort of time period. And any photon that then hits our detector is not going to be counted. It's not going to be acquired and registered. And so when we get to high photon count rates, we start missing a lot of photons. So this plot on the right shows a Poisson PDF for a particular photon arrival rate. And then if you account for dead time in your probability distribution function, it looks like this blue curve. And we call this the Mueller distribution after Jörg Mueller, who derived this distribution back in 1973. The Mueller distribution, notably these are parameterized by the same photon arrival rates. It's narrower and it's shifted. Um, and so our noise model in our detection process is, is not well described by a Poisson distribution function. So changing that noise model means we have to change the goodness of fit metric in order to process this kind of data. Now this has been investigated by Josh Rapp in quite a bit of detail, but that was all in hard target LiDAR applications. Um, in atmospheric LiDAR, what we're doing is dealing with what we call distributed target applications. Um, in the, and the mapping is not exactly one-to-one. -one. However, we've been able to do a simple demonstration of this uh, in, our, in our group. Josh Carnes is an electrical engineer in EOL, and he was able to help us modify our acquisition system so that we ac acquire those raw counts. So now we're not building histograms anymore. And when we do that, we can actually account for dead time when we process that data. This is, so this is a, a, an, a histogram, nevertheless, just for visualization purposes of some cloud data that we acquired at very high resolution. So this time duration, roughly 60 seconds, that's typically the resolution we bin our MPD data at. Um, so this is very high resolution for MPD. We're just looking at roughly 300 meter um, range and uh, obviously very noisy data. And we also have a laser pulse width of 100 meters uh, in length. But we can process that using PTV with a noise model that accounts for dead time uh, and recover basically a subpulse length uh, image of the photon arrival rates from that cloud. 
Now, we obviously haven't been able to validate this against anything, but it does demonstrate the concept that we can process very high resolution data um, and account for dead time uh, in, in that process. So we have a detector. It's described by some probability distribution function. And from that, we're able to develop a goodness of fit metric based on the negative log likelihood. And in that process, we can recover alpha, that mean number of photons. However, for atmospheric LIDAR applications, we're generally not that interested in the mean number of photons. What we really uh, want to recover is some state parameter uh, of the atmosphere where the mean number of, of photons is a function of that state parameter. So as I've sort of mentioned before, we use this forward modeling approach where we vary x in order to get a good fit. Um, there are some interesting benefits to this sort of forward modeling approach. And I just want to highlight one here. So say that we actually are making an over-constrained observation where we have two observations of one state variable. So we have these two observations, but we're actually only trying to recover one state variable X. So our standard method for processing this is usually we'll just perform an inversion on both of those observations and then we'll get two estimates, two separate estimates of that state variable, which we have to merge. How do we merge them? Well, most of the time it's using some sort of heuristics. We're just going to try to figure out where should we use x1 versus x2 based on any number of parameters that seem to work or make it look good. Um, using the forward modeling approach, we can avoid that whole heuristics problem. There, with the, with the forward modeling approach, we're only ever estimating one state variable. We're just projecting it onto our two separate observations. And if we have a good noise model, we're gonna inherently, it's gonna inherently handle the trade-offs and uncertainty between these two different observations to get you an optimal estimate of the state, uh, even though the very, even though the noise in the prop in these two observations may be different. So I have a simple toy example of this where we consider a single state variable shown here down in the bottom as a function of time, but we're gonna have two observations. One's sensitive to very high values of the state variable. And you see that in the blue here, the signals that were acquired corresponding to peaks in the state variable. The other observation is sensitive to small values of the state variable. So we get signals in the orange when there are troughs in the state variable. Now that my simulated data was too noisy, I can't do a direct retrieval of this, but I can uh, apply PTV to this problem um, where we only process each channel, channel individually. So if I only process channel one, I get the blue line and I'm able to recover peaks, but I'm not really able to recover any of the troughs. If I only process the channel two data, I can recover the troughs, but I really can't recover the peaks. However, we can apply the forward modeling approach to both these observations. Um, and then we're able to recover both the troughs and the peaks in the signal. So it's not identically the same, but this idea actually maps very nicely onto uh, the temperature retrievals in the MPD. So, the temperature retrievals with MPD actually rely on three LIDARs. So the, the LIDARs with this capability are actually three LIDARs all packed into one. We have a water vapor dial system. We have an HSRL for recovering backscatter coefficient, and we have an oxygen dial for recovering temperature. However, each of these LIDAR systems have cross dependencies on the others recovered state variables. And uh, the direction of those dependencies are depicted here as arrows. And the strength of the arrow indicates the strength of the dependency. Uh, so in our standard retrieval, what we do is we estimate the water vapor independently. We estimate the backscatter coefficient independently. And then we feed those, sorry, we feed those products into the temperature retrieval. And there's two potential drawbacks to this. First of all, uh, these are potentially noisy, noisy, noisy estimates. And our temperature retrieval is already very sensitive to noise. So we're feeding noisy estimates into 
this retrieval and potentially we're going to get compounding noise. But in addition to that, we're ignoring these other cross dependencies uh, in our uh, in our LIDAR system. So this is a place where applying a forward modeling approach could potentially allow us to apply a, to do, perform a global estimation in such a way that we get uh, we get consistency between the retrievals of all of these terms. We would invert them simultaneously. And we have done an initial um, proof of concept with this, where we've built uh, a little bit of a temperature architecture to demonstrate it. Um, shown on the top, you see a curtain plot of altitude uh, versus time. And this is the retrieved temperature using uh, PTV. And then we have a sound overlaid. And then this is just, again, that looking at that sound comparison, we get temperature using PTV versus the recovered versus the sun temperature, and also as compared to the uh, assumed lapse rate based on the service station. So it's it's very, very preliminary results. Uh, it's, it's just a proof of concept at this point, but it does seem to have potential, at least in concept. So PTV has been successfully applied to high spectral resolution LIDAR at NCAR. We've applied it to water vapor dial retrievals. And um, I've shown an example case where we've also been able to apply it to cloud probe data. But I think in some sense, uh, a better metric for judging the value of research can be how many new research threads did it lead to. And I think that PTV has been very successful in that respect. Uh, we've realized that we really need to understand a lot more about detector noise models and photon counting LIDAR. And we also need to understand how uh, dynamic targets, particularly things like clouds, uh, rapidly evolving aerosol scenes can affect um, those noise models as well. Uh, we're also now realizing uh, we need to look more at hardware design based on what we've learned from this. So we're looking at new ways of doing acquisition in photon counting LIDAR systems, new types of hist histogram methods. It's also resulted or caused us to go back and reevaluate how we do some of our hardware characterization and calibration. Um, a lot of our hardware requirements have been built on the assumption, although not explicit, that the scenes we're interrogating have uncorrelated structure that we can't, we can't um, capitalize on correlated structure within the scenes. Uh, and that's causing us to really We'll go back and look at our requirements flow downs and consider can we do things with lower cost hardware and, and less lower performing hardware and still get good results. And this, I think, is really important for a lot of this space applications for LiDAR systems. Finally, um, PTV, we're, we're looking at new applications for PTV. I mentioned looking at temperature retrievals on the MPD. Um, and also briefly showed how we can process very high resolution backscatter images uh, using PTV. So I wanna acknowledge uh, the funding that's enabled this research. Uh, Willem has been able to collaborate with us because of a NSF grant uh, that funded him for that effort. And also uh, NCAR is funded by and sponsored by a, a NSF cooperative agreement. Uh, with that, I will bring up my references and I'm ready to take questions. Wow. Thank you, Matt, for a wonderful um, talk on the like, novel signal processing um, <laughs> using medical imaging techniques um, for atmospheric um, observations. I know, I who know very little on the subject really appreciated your overview slides. So have you taught a class on this? No. <laughs> I <laughs> think should. it was excellent. <laughs> well, I, I think a, a fair statement is that Nolan's a real expert. And so um, it's it's because he's been willing to work with me and, and kind of walk me through a lot of this that we've been able to do as much as we can. Maybe we should bring him in for an EOL seminar then is I think <laughs> the take home message there. So we do have time, we have plenty of time for questions and comments. May I please remind the audience to use the Slido interface below the presentation screen to ask your question. And we do have some questions that have come in. Um, and let me highlight it. 
we have a question from John Shrek, who gave um, a, a seminar talk last week on neural networks uh, for the holographic imaging. And he asks, do you see opportunities for using machine learning for helping with processing? Yeah. Um, so first of all, I think it it's important to highlight that I've, I've focused on PTV as a signal processing technique. It is not the it is not the only advanced signal processing technique that can be applied to these kinds of problems. Um, and there, what, one that comes to mind is uh, noise to void, which is a machine learning technique that also performs denoising. I don't know if it's been used for inversion. Uh, but beside that, um, John, I know is no stranger to like picking out the little details of the problem where machine learning really helps out a lot. And uh, I think this might be an example of that where we spend a lot of our processing time uh, searching for the right regularization parameter. We have to process the scene many times in order to find that. So potentially you could use uh, a machine learning technique in order to infer what the right regularization parameter is for your scene. And that would, uh, that would save you a lot of processing time if you could do that successfully. The challenge is, getting enough data in order to really successfully apply that um, machine learning technique. Thanks, John. Maybe there's a collaborate, a further collaboration on that. Okay, click. Okay. Um, we have a question from James Pinto who asks, can you discuss how the retrieval technique can be used to provide error estimates of the MPD? Yeah, so um, there are a couple ways to answer this question. So first of all, um, the way we do error estimation using our standard technique would probably map very similarly on to the PTV technique. So um, for those of you familiar with LiDAR signal processing, sort of the standard methods, a lot of times we use linear propagation of error, and that really does not perform very well on water vapor retrievals. So we've adapted our signal processing. This is another benefit of collaborating with someone who has expertise in signal processing. We learned this from Willem uh, and, and employ a, a method called bootstrapping. And it's a numerical technique where we, we do a retrieval using two independent data sets, and then we do it again and again and again, and we build up an error estimate by repeating that process several times. Um, and that gives us a very nice, a very consistent, very good error estimate that contains the statistical error in our uh, process. We could apply that with PTV as well. The challenge is um, PTV is more computationally expensive than the standard technique. Uh, running that over and over again is, is fairly expensive. The way we do error estimates right now is a little bit of a, a hybrid approach or I don't know if, Villain would approve of me calling it a hybrid approach, but it's, it's a little bit of a heuristic solution that seems to work fairly well, which is we actually vary the initial conditions in our retrieval. We, we start low and we start high, and then we look for where we get convergence. And if we don't get convergence, that's basically noisy data and we have large errors. Um, and then regions where we do get convergence, we, we know that we can hang our hat on that estimate. Thank you. Still have time for questions. Um, so in one of your slides, you showed comparisons with SANS. And I really noticed that the, and it showed that the PTV does a really great job in the free troposphere, like above four kilometers. So why does the standard method do so poorly at these higher levels? And why does the PTV do a great job? I mean, the fit is remarkable. Like, I guess what I'm asking is, is what's happening in the atmosphere, like in the free troposphere, that both techniques give really different results relative to the SANS? Yeah, so a couple of different angles to that. One is uh, we tend to have a lot more signal in um, the boundary layer, right? We've got a lot of aerosols and stuff scattering light back into the instrument. So because we have all that signal, the standard retrieval works really well in those regions. Um, whereas you really need to do a lot more averaging to recover a signal up in the free troposphere where you don't have a lot of particulates scattering. Um, the other 
point to make is because you're doing a forward modeling approach with PTV, it's not as reactive to noise. Um, we have a noise model and that, that kind of inherently tells you like, this is really noisy. Don't try to fit this data too well. Whereas when we, when we take that step I showed where we say, and never mind, this is a random variable. Let's just say it's really the truth. Then you process. We were taking a a, a a ratio of random numbers, but then taking the log of that in the in our retrieval equation. That gives you really noisy data. So it gets really erratic uh, when you get up into low get into low signal regimes with the standard method. Right. Hmm. Thank you. I wanted a, a sort of real world answer to that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Let's see. Uh, we have a question from Christina McCluskey. And she asked, great presentation, Matt, very cool. Are the functions needed for using this method unique to each project? How possible will it be to apply this method to past and future field data? Yeah, so I mean, the requirement here is you need to be able to map what you want to know onto your observed quantities in some sort of deterministic way. So you need to have a physical model for your instrument. Um, one of the challenges with this is um, forward modeling has a tendency to reveal the uh, mistakes you've made in the modeling process. So you, you get biases in your estimates if your forward model is inaccurate. Uh, so as long as you have a, as long as you know that you have a well-described um, observational signal, and those physics are accurate, you can derive a model and do this recovery. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's unique to each instrument, but it's not unique to each field project or, or each observational case. Great. Thank you for that question. That one. Um, we have a question from Jung Kyung K, your colleague uh, at RSF, and he asks, how sensitive is the PTV on temperature retrieval when the correlation between water vapor and backscatter coefficient is strong? Is the calculation cost of PTV expensive compared to the standard method? Yeah. Um, how sensitive it on the temperature retrieval and the correlation between water vapor and backscatter coefficient it's strong. Uh, it's it remains sensitive. Um, I'm I'm not completely understanding the, the impact of the correlation between water vapor and backscatter. Um, I, I will say that at this point, this retrieval is pretty. Um, what, what do I want to say? It's, it's, it's in the very early stages. So I can't say a lot about the temperature retrieval at this point. And in fact, we're having to go back and reevaluate some of our physical modeling steps. Um, but I can certainly answer the second question that it, PTV is considerably more expensive to implement uh, in the sense that I, uh, we run all the PTV retrievals on uh, Cheyenne. Actually, we run it on Casper. <laughs> we got in trouble for running it on Cheyenne. Um, but you know, with high performance compute, computing really becoming uh, more of a standard uh, and a lot of you know commercially available capability there, uh, I think it's less of a barrier than folks are treating it at this point. So as I mentioned, we can process a field project with PTV. It's certainly possible. Uh, and I can process a day um, on Casper in about, I think it's less than two hours we can process a day. I think also with machine learning becoming de rigueur in, in, in the earth science field, um, it's what you're saying is true that supercomputing is probably becoming more of the standard. Uh, yeah, and, and I should say that Willem is researching how to implement this on a GPU and further accelerate it. I think he was, he thinks he may be able to get about a factor of 10 speed up for the GPU. Thank you, Jung Kyung. We have um, a question from Jeff Stith. Um, very interesting and seems to have a broad application. Have you used these techniques to come up with optimum averaging methods 
for combining multiple cloud probes to obtain the best measurement of the various moments, total water, content, reflectivity, et cetera? Uh, I mean, the simple answer, Jeff, is no, but that I think in principle could be done, assuming that if you can assume that your cloud particles are spherical um, and, and you know relate all those various moments, then I don't see why it couldn't be done. So I think it, there's a lot, there's certainly potential there. Maybe a, a postdoc, there's a postdoc in the making in that question. <laughs> that's, that's right. Or a PhD maybe. <laughs> It, it would be a fantastic, I, I would love to see somebody uh, research that. And, and yeah. of course, we yeah. have the processing framework to, to help support that if somebody yeah. invests. Yeah. That was a, that's a great idea coming from Jeff Stiff. Yeah. Um, we have a question from um, Chris Burkhardt. Nice presentation, Matt. PTV looks like it has some real promise for many of our instruments. In your early slide showing PTV processed HSRL data while climbing through a cloud, can you discuss the apparent capture of higher detail, but with apparently diminished maxima? Seems counterintuitive to me. And Matt, please feel free to share the slide if you, if you want to. Yeah, okay, first I gotta memorize this question. <laughs> <laughs> higher detail with apparently diminished maxima, okay. Um, yeah, that's the one. Yeah, so I, I think are you you may be referring to um, some of these lines here, um, which. So when we see these Mac, these kind of peaks and stuff in, in liquid clouds, uh, I don't know if they're the product of noise processes um, where you have, we, what, in order to do this retrieval, it's again a ratio of random variables. So you may potentially have cases where one signal is falling off rapidly and the other is not and so noise in one produces this kind of maxima effect as as you have this decay i this is my best <laughs> jump at explaining that um but yeah i mean they're not completely identical there's there do seem to be a few uh differences between the retrievals great I it's, yeah, it's difficult to answer <laughs> that one. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, well, I, I, I should say quickly that that was a big reason we really wanted to look at something where we could do validation, do a direct validation comparison. It's just because um, there were other data products with the HSRL as well. And I, I found myself scratching my head and going, I don't really know if that's real. Um, so we really wanted to do this direct validation comparison. Do you have any future validation um, projects um, that will look into this? Uh, not for the HSRL. Um, we don't really have an operational software that's capable of continuing to do this. Um, it was sort of our, our foray into seeing if we could write a PTV framework here at NCAR. It was a proof of concept. Sorry. Yeah. Project, yeah. Willem <laughs> has been very open as well about the fact that you know he wrote his paper on this, but um, and did his best to validate his his retrievals. But it still is it's very hard to do that with an HSRL data products. Okay. Well, um, that was many questions. That was wonderful. Um, if we don't have any further questions, um, we're near the seminar hour. Um, if you are interested in Dr. Matthew Heyman's presentation and have further questions, want to collaborate, please reach out to him via his email, which is provided on the seminar flyer. On behalf of EOL, I would like to thank Dr. Heyman for his presentation using innovative signal processing techniques to improve atmospheric observations. Thank you everyone and have a good day.